Give me fuel, give me fire, give me that which I desire. Ooh. The most popular heavy metal band in the world, they built their success on an uncompromising musical vision and the fierce loyalty of their fans. We're just four lucky fans that got together and started playing. This could be you. Their fans are so hardcore and so into them. It's like almost like a religion. They are the Led Zeppelin of this generation. For Metallica, hard rock meant playing hard, on stage and off. We're living the rock and roll lifestyle to the very, very fullest. You know, whatever the bill was, it was all worth it. It's all rock and roll. It's all being on tour. Their drinking became the stuff of legend, and the rock press dubbed them. Alcoholica. 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 <laughs> I'd be so ripped out of my head. Next time we came into town, you know, there were boyfriends and dads looking for me. Amid the mayhem, Metallica endured its share of hardship and tragedy. The road horrors, the deaths, the things, the breakings of arms and burnings and everything, they were just challenges for us. They were rocked hard by a freak pyrotechnic disaster. James Hetfield looks like that torch that they carry up the stairs to light the Olympic fire. And they refused to surrender when a bus crash claimed the life of bassist Cliff Burton. And I turned around and I saw Cliff's legs sticking out from underneath the bus. Through it all, they set the standard for no compromise, straightforward heavy metal mastery. We're selfish and honest about it. That's the two things that I think keep Metallica going, honesty and selfishness. We're doing this for ourselves. Tonight, the underground sensation who became one of the most influential forces in hard rock history, Metallica, behind the music. Metallica rose from garage band to global stadium phenomenon on their own terms. By the time they began making radio singles and music videos, they had already carved out a powerful place in heavy metal history. They were playing arenas before MTV even heard of them. Radio was nowhere, you know, MTV, definitely big no-no. No one would help us, so we played live, we played till we dropped. Metallica's music is laden with hard-hitting images of adolescent rage, suicide, drug addiction, mental illness, and political violence. Their lyrics take on taboos, set to the spirit of pure rock and roll rebellion. A battery works off positive and negative, you know? So, uh, we were very good at the negative stuff. <laughs> and at the heart of Metallica's success lies the unity and collective strength of its four singular personalities. We grew up together, and it was like family, and you're... You know, your fighting brothers, your, you know, loving brothers. I've been together with James Hetfield for half my life. There's a tremendous amount of respect for each other, even though none of us would ever come to it. <laughs> they still are very close and still very compatible. And it is their baby. James is, is like, I would say, the creative driving force. Anything that Metallica's going to stamp their name on has to be up to his standard before it'll happen. You know, the four of us bring something different to the table. And when it comes down to reading a contract or, you know, sorting out some business thing, we all look at Lars. And he does a large part of the arranging also of the music. Jason really developed into the live guy. He is the never-ending connection with the fans. He'll stop the fan and go looking for people to sign autographs, you know? He's the first guy that comes to me and tells me if I'm losing it. And Kirk, the slightly insane free spirit. Eccentric, you know, quirk hammock. He's the spiritual, that kind of vibe. And the only way to maintain a band that have four characters that are so different from each other is to allow each other the space to exist and do what they want. And we knew uh, from day one that this was going to be our lives and uh, we were going to make this thing work no matter what. James Hetfield was born in Downey, California in 1963 and raised in a strict Christian science family broken by divorce. When James was a teenager, cancer claimed his mother's life. Doctors and hospitals are kind of like taboo and 
With the help of God, you will get better. You know, you're kind of going with it, but you feel it's not quite right, and you're at school, and okay, now it's time for health class, and I have to get up and leave. You know, learning about the body wasn't necessary. This is a shell, and what's true is your soul, and all this. So actually leaving class, and then getting, you know, all the little kids. So that was the beginning of alienation, I believe, as a child. Back then, James was like the most introverted person you've ever seen. He didn't really talk. Anytime you'd see him, he'd just, hey, how's it going? Pick up his guitar and just start jamming away, you know? In 1963, on the other side of the globe, Lars Ulrich was born to a prominent Danish tennis pro. For a time, he was groomed to follow in his father's footsteps. The thing was that in Denmark, um, I was somebody, you know, ranked sort of somewhere in the top tens in my junior years and so on. When I came to the States in like 1980, I was basically like, I mean, I wasn't even ranked in the top ten on the block I lived on. In the beginning, he was sort of kind of an air guitar guy, you know, and going completely, uh, you know, crazy with his broomstick or whatever, or a kind of a racket, you know. Of course, a tennis racket can also be sort of an air guitar, right? Drums had been the kind of hobby away from tennis, and at the tail end of, of 1979, there was what was called the new wave of British heavy metal. Iron Maiden, Death Leopard, Motorhead, Saxon, Tigers of Pantang, Diamond Head. Angel Witch, you know, the list goes on. It was the attitude. The attitude came from Motorhead. Rock and roll is supposed to bring you crazed joy and rebellion for no apparent reason, for its own sake, right? That's what we started out as music to piss your parents off of. James and Lars met in Los Angeles in 1981, drawn together by faith, and the musicians wanted ads in a local paper. You know, under heavy metal, there were two guys, and it was me and him. <laughs> Lars had this drum kit, it was ten different colors, one cymbal, he hit it, it kept falling over. Finally he sits down and he's just like, I'm going, are you, are you sure this guy played drums before? What Lars may have lacked musically, he more than made up for with his personal connections in the heavy metal scene. Lars had a friend who was producing a compilation album featuring local metal bands. Lars called me up and said, uh, hey, if I put together a band, can I be on your compilation album? I said, yeah, absolutely, no problem. Lars had really had a spot on the record, but no band. So, hmm, in my kind of will and maybe greediness to get going in this thing, said, okay, uh, we'll hook up. The band had a spot reserved on an upcoming album. Soon they had a second guitarist, Dave Mustaine. I went in there and I set up my gear. I started warming up and these guys were all in the other room. And I walk in there and I said, uh, come on, let's go. And they said, you got the job. And I went, that was easy. In 1981, Metallica's frenetic two-guitar sound was a direct assault on L.A.'s softcore glam rock scene. We weren't doing what they were doing. They were playing pretty much cheeky music because they wanted the girls, and all we wanted to do was rule the world. If you came here to see spandex and big hair, this ain't your band, and that was kind of became our war cry, you know? Metallica met with an apathetic response in the L.A. clubs, which only served to fuel their aggressive play. That developed our style. We were up on stage. We wanted attention. We're going to play louder, we're going to play faster. Our whole existence pretty much was for guitar dominating the world and getting liquored up. In the winter of 1981, a benefit for Metal Mania magazine brought the band to San Francisco. The city was a hotbed for the new heavy metal movement. Everybody just wanted to make the, the most obnoxious, loudest, scare your parents, annoy people, um, fastest music you could. That heavy crunch crunch stuff was, was way new and everybody loved it, you know. It tickles your, your same kind of funny bone that makes you break windows when you're a 